Okay, take it All away. All right, so we start. Okay, you can start the, the watch. We have plenty of time. Okay, so I'm... So I, I don't know who put this uh, long topic of the presentation, but uh, in general what I'm going to talk about how we can uh, uh, really run uh, workloads that involve uh, networking with all the advancements in RDMA and uh, efficiency alongside with the NVIDIA GPU. So it's like Mellanox NVIDIA, how we can uh, really take advantage of the containers and, and, and run those workloads in a very optimized fashion. Um, so, putting things into containers is, 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 is really nice because it allows, um, you know, these heterogeneous uh, things to, to work uh, uh, really fast and uh, um, I'm going to focus in this presentation on uh, HPC and um, uh, actually I'm going to focus on machine learning but it uh, goes uh, same uh, with HPC and actually the workload we run here is uh, with Horovod so it's kind of uh, mixed uh, uh, ML and HPC and um, when you want to work, uh, run those workloads, we really want to get an optimized performance and really take advantage of all the hardware that we put and uh, have the CPU as uh, little uh, idle time as uh, possible uh, to really do things uh, very efficiently. Uh, GPU Direct is yet another important feature where we can actually move data very efficiently between the network and the GPU, especially if you have those big boxes with GPU like the DGX or any other uh, box that has many GPUs and many NICs, uh, moving data directly between the network uh, and the GPU is very valuable, otherwise you kind of uh, uh, set to the mercy of the PCI hierarchy and uh, uh, kind of have a lot of uh, bottlenecks in the PCI and in the memory. So moving data with GPU direct is extremely important. And uh, we think you know Kubernetes can be a very uh, a good way to, to do it and to distribute those uh, jobs and uh, provision them. However, uh, it's it's a real challenge, and uh, whoever I talk to is saying that it takes hours and hours and maybe days to to deploy it um, uh, without any help, and also making uh, making a mistake throughout the process is very not rewarding. At the end of the day, nothing really works. But Christian, I think this one is is dead, so I'll just use the page down. Ah, okay, switch it off. All right, okay. So um, basically, you know, it, it turns out that there are so many details you need to to take care of where, where, when you try to, to deploy those, such uh, workloads that um, it's really, really complicated. So on the node level, you need to make sure you have all the drivers installed correctly, the CUDA drivers, the Mellanox driver, the different toolkits and the libraries for DNN and the GPU Direct and the Docker. So it's like a lot of stuff and drivers and frameworks that you need to get uh, installed. And obviously on the orchestration level, there is a lot of plugins that you need to make sure you didn't forget any one of them. And also on the container level, all the application there, the TensorFlow, the Horvod. So it's like a big slew of, uh, of things that you really need to install and make one mistake and it's all broken. And it, it really, it really for, for people that really know to do the DevOps for this, it really takes um, hours to, to install. And I, I think we really want to make sure that uh, when we uh, provide some uh, uh, recipe of how to do it, uh, you can do it in an error-prone fashion and you can do it in uh, less than an hour. Actually, I would like to do it even faster, but you know, today to, to go and, and have a deployment, it. Um, it can probably take less than an hour, and I think that's that's a good uh, good start. Uh, and and our components are kind of going to be um, uh, everything is open source, and it's going to be split between some stuff on the deployment node, on the master node, and then in each one of the worker nodes. So um, we're basically using uh, two important tools uh, as part of the Docker and the Kubernetes uh, focus on. Uh, 
uh, DPOPs on the deployment node, and a lot of thanks to, to, to NVIDIA. And this is really uh, specializing in uh, installation of uh, everything that has to do with the, uh, with the GPU and with the RDMA. We actually, as Mellanox, we also uh, provided and contributed a playbook uh, to install the Mellanox offered and the GPU Direct. We're currently kind of um, uh, pushing it uh, into DevOps, but it's available um, in, in the meantime from Mellanox. And uh, also Kubeflow is uh, a, a great stuff where it enables uh, uh, native uh, platform for development and everything. It uh, really simplifies those uh, machine learning uh, um, machine learning uh, uh, workload uh, deployments, um, and it. Uh, it's really nice because uh, for workloads that you run with MPI, so all the Horvod library is focused on on MPI. It really makes it easy to to deploy those uh, all reduce. Uh, and we put here some uh, reference, so the slides will be available afterwards. So there's like the recipe on uh, Mellanox community, so you can just go and uh, do it uh, step by step, and we'll keep on adding uh, more documentation into doc at malnox.com for both uh, InfiniBand and Ethernet. At the end of the day, all of them will use uh, RDMA and also the InfiniBand eventually uh, will also deploy additional uh, offload for the ML workloads called Sharp, uh, where we can actually offload more into the network. Um, the way, it, um, the way we deploy from the deployment node uh, really includes all those components. So you can see on, on the master node, it will be the do Docker, Kubernetes, and the uh, uh, Kubeflow, and uh, the MPI operator, uh, which is part of the Kubeflow. Uh, and then on the worker nodes, um, starting from the hardware, it will have the Connectix and the uh, NVIDIA GPUs uh, that will be uh, exposed to the host with the relevant uh, driver that all will be kind of deployed for the, uh, for the master node and the uh, deployment node and you know, putting everything together into uh, all the way up into the pods. Um, and with these tools, you can uh, really do it uh, much faster, so less than an hour. Some performance that uh, we publish. So this is the topology that uh, we use. We actually use four nodes, uh, four worker nodes, and a total of um, uh, uh, eight uh, NVIDIA GPUs uh, per a, a per node and uh, four adapters in each node. So uh, quite a nice uh, configuration, and um, uh, we pretty much run TensorFlow. Uh, there's a full data here, and the kind of we show the picture here with all the uh, tools that we use to to deploy that. Um, and this graph uh, shows the results of uh, ResNet uh, 50. You can see uh, a four set of uh, bars. On the left bar, you can see the uh, the the TCP performance uh, with nickel, so that will be without any optimization. In each kind of uh, uh, set of bars, uh, there is um, uh, there is a list of uh, one GPU, two GPU, uh, up to uh, 32 GPUs. The green one is always uh, 32 uh, GPUs. So you can first see the scaling, as well as uh, the scaling in the amount of images per second that they can process. Um, um, between different GPUs. So let's just look at the green lines. Uh, basically, the first green line is the TCP. That will be the baseline. And then once we added the InfiniBand support with all the RDMA, you get this improvement. And then uh, the next set um, here, uh, that would be that set. Uh, uh, really has the full optimization, including both GPU direct and RDMA. That will give the best results. And the last one is kept for the reference. That will be the ideal scaling uh, of 32 nodes. Uh, I just have a, a maybe a different view that can also explain. Uh, where here you can see the count of. Uh, uh, GPUs on the x-axis, uh, all the way to 32 uh, GPUs, and each line uh, really represent uh, a different mode. So you can start from the lower line, the the, uh, the blue line that is with the TCP, and then we start adding optimizations, the uh, adding InfiniBand uh, using Nickel, and then adding also GPU Direct to the third line. Uh, and that's the gap uh, to the ideal. And you can actually see that from TCP, if you add all the optimization, you get 35% uh, improvement. 
that's pretty cool. And now the installation of, of this is, is really uh, simple and repetitive. Uh, you're welcome to, to take a look at uh, our uh, documentation and uh, really reproduce it uh, step by step. All right? Thank you. And I think okay, I'm cool. also up for the next one. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this one is actually strange. Something. Ah, uh, I, I need to zoom it out. Ah, oh, I think it was like uh, pasted or whatever. There's something stranger. Anyway. Yeah, uh, maybe the something went wrong. Anyway. Ah, uh, all right. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Mellanox container journey, tell you a little bit about uh, um, how, how many years we've been uh, working on containers and evolving that uh, uh, from the Mellanox side. So, so it really started on 2015 where we had a couple of uh, smart guys from the CTO teams that were saying, well, there has these like uh, Linux containers and they need network or maybe we should do something about uh, InfiniBand. And we were starting to research that and, you know, we weren't sure if we need to, to do anything there in the containers. But that's how it started and, and we basically saw that uh, for RDMA there's some stuff that is uh, needed um, to perform some isolation or some separation of uh, namespace in order to, to enable that. So that time we really started with something really basic for uh, the InfiniBand. Uh, we looked at the subnet manager. We thought we'll get away with it. We'll support the container and that's it. And we actually did it, sub uh, submitted it uh, upstream and then things went quiet. And then <laughs> About um, two years later, in 2017, we woke up again and we said, okay, we need to do something more in the containers and maybe some um, limitation or uh, uh, throttling of resources. Uh, so we started adding the RDMA C group um, and started to look at the OCI spec and uh, starting to really enable the HPC workloads, which we were the first uh, thing we ever started running on, on container. And then I think um, in 2018, I think this is where we kind of starting, uh, started to have a lot of focus. We started to add some uh, monitoring for resources. We started being more serious with the IP route and RDMA tool and uh, more isolation on a, a process ID. We then uh, um, started adding some uh, more uh, rocky network namespace support and uh, uh, we can share single RDMA device. This was like the first uh, usage model. Uh, we start realizing that we not only need to play with the kernel, but also start uh, enabling more and more of the Docker use cases. So that's where we started to look at more Docker and DevOps. And uh, we started to add the Docker SRIOV plugin. And uh, later on that year, we also uh, started to enable uh, more use cases. So I guess in the previous round, um, beyond HPC, we started enabling also nested virtualization and enable Docker containers to actually run inside uh, virtual machines. Uh, we started to enable more storage and started to, to care more about the, the, the DevOps uh, community. And then afterwards, we started to enable more and more use cases around database and some uh, telco service provider use cases and make it more general beyond InfiniBand, do some more stuff on the Rocky, providing some uh, uh, internet lag for high availability, some more bandwidth scaling and uh, um, uh, leveraging more and more of the SRIV infrastructure. On another trend, uh, we were starting to support not only the RDMA, but uh, the user space access that this RDMA driver brings really enabled us to run both uh, DPDK and also VMA in a container. So DPDK basically is a user mode ability to send and receive packets in a very, very efficient uh, manner. That thing really enables uh, um, virtual network functions to run 
inside VMs and it's pretty much uh, needed for the telco or service provider community. Also being used in, in the cloud as part of the uh, way to deliver infrastructure. Uh, VMAs are user mode uh, TCP and UDP IP stack. Uh, that can actually run also in container and accelerate certain uh, application uh, like financial applications for uh, high performing or some uh, other media and entertainment kind of things. So we really need enable using those uh, all the, the same technology we could really enable more and more functionality inside containers. We continue in adding uh, a uh, better virtualization for the networking. So uh, in Ethernet, a lot of the networking is, is actually underlying uh, using some kind of an SDN. They would also use some kind of uh, encapsulation with VXLAN when you deploy in, in the cloud. So with, with ASAP technology, we can actually accelerate that SDN and we can really enable uh, uh, use cases for Rocky in a fully clouded environment. So we kept adding those things and, you know, uh, we added more workloads then for AI and machine learning. Uh, this uh, happened uh, uh, last year. Uh, we pay more attention to the plugin uh, for the SROV and the device, and we keep enhancing uh, uh, those plugins um, uh, for Docker, Kubernetes, and, and so on. We continue uh, to innovate there. Uh, this year, I, I think uh, a lot to focus on the RDMA network uh, namespace support for isolation. This is what I presented before, the, how we really I isolate those devices and really make this RDMA device finally a first-class citizen within the networking uh, of the containers. Um, make it more look like uh, the way we do with uh, Ethernet. Um, and... Uh, I think we'll, we'll continue to, to work and, and I think uh, a lot of the focus that uh, we do now is making sure everything is, is part uh, not only of the open source but also on distribution so that it will be more easy for, for people to consume. So we work uh, together with uh, Red Hat on the OpenShift initiative and so on. So you can see a long journey and I think, um, you know, if it still takes uh, one hour to deploy the a machine learning workload. I think we still have a long way to go, and there's plurality of tools and a lot of stuff. But I think uh, you know we're shifting gears. We understand the the importance. We understand the need uh, uh, to work in uh, this environment and how uh, how beneficial it is. So we, we keep uh, working, and uh, we probably need to to do a lot more to to get it uh, much more solid and and easy to use. But this is definitely the direction that uh, we go. Um, and I think I had another slide. All right. And I had uh, another slide showing a like, few examples of uh, actually public, uh, uh, public information about uh, usage of the containers uh, in both uh, uh, cloud, machine learning, and AI uh, scenarios. So that's all pretty well. And uh, we see more and more people using this. All right. Thank, Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Um, and since you have to go and uh, catch a flight, maybe if we have special questions to draw, then we can just... I said I don't want to do this, but I think that's maybe a very good way. <laughs> you make so an exception. Have, yeah, yeah, I make an exception. <laughs> so if you guys have questions with regards to InfiniBand or like Mellanox. This is thing. This is a mic. Okay. So I've built several containers that work for, uh, you know, running, running on the InfiniBand networks. And maybe I'm doing this wrong, but... Just to install the MoFed user space drivers, it takes half a gig of my of a machine image, uh, you know, or my, my my Docker image. This doesn't seem like a good thing as we try to optimize and uh, you know clean up our containers for HPC. Am I not doing this right? Um, are there is there a good tutorial for how to build the user space you know MoFed support or OFED support in my container image, and how do I get this down, say to somewhat manageable? Uh, you know, sizes for, for my containers. But the same goes images. with uh, CUDA libraries, right? Yeah, oh, similar, exactly. As I soon mean, as I add CUDA, it's going to get twice as bad. Yeah, exactly. wait for CUDA, wait for the NVIDIA talk. But uh, I guess I, I told you we have a lot to do. I mean, this is just ending now. Um, send me an email. 
I, I, I really want to look uh, into that. And I, I, yeah, I can share these. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. installing the MoFed, you know, user space. You know, there's yeah, the, we the, definitely, the yeah, we definitely need to look at it, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we can improve. We we're, we're so happy that we managed to to install it and get it work. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> we we the real real life will have more constraints, and uh, we will definitely uh, look at it and uh, optimize. Cool. But MoFed is not as broad as CUDA is, right? So the, it should be a little bit simpler even than, than CUDA, yeah, I think? Yeah, first of all, a lot of the uh, Melanox offered um, uh, is becoming a lot of... A lot of it is, is going to be upstream anyway. <laughs> well, that's so the problem is the, the upstream drivers aren't compatible. So, so if I install on my, my MoFed on my host, no, I no. can't use the user space No, no, that's, co that's correct. For... And uh, today, if you want to use GPU Direct, then it's not really available uh, on the upstream. So those are things we work to, to fix. And, you know, the ultimate goal is to have everything in, in the upstream. It just, like, takes a lot of uh, software baby steps and community and a lot of uh, uh, other things. But this is def definitely clear that we, we would like everything to be in distro. So you install your Red Hat or whatever whatever favorite awesome. distro you have, then it's in. We know what we need to do, but there is a lot of stuff that uh, we need to, to get them uh, through. Uh, about the, memory, the, the, the storage uh, footprint of that image, I, I definitely uh, want to look into that. Um, I, I didn't imagine, imagine it's so big, but uh, yeah, I, I guess... Uh, where we need to walk and then uh, we'll start running eventually. Yeah, yeah. They're, well, they're, those two things are probably related too. So yeah, if yeah, you yeah. can upstream it, then, then that should yeah, shrink. I think, and I, can uh, I think in the meanwhile, until we figure out all the pieces that are needed for upstreaming, then you know we should uh, definitely look. Maybe it's like you, may, you, you might be doing something wrong. <laughs> or if you're not, and, and that, you know, we can point you out. to so, so let's look at it. Cool. Great. Thanks. All right. More questions. And <laughs> sorry, uh, it you, says you missed him. So I was curious. Uh, I haven't tried running <coughs> Docker containers on an, a native IB uh, solution in a while. So, and it, you still don't have. You can't do a bridge device with if you're running in in the InfiniBand mode on the on the NIC, right? Yeah, that's correct. Ethernet is more like uh, whatever you familiar with the the Ethernet. It, the, those uh, like uh, running OVS and all yeah. of that will will definitely work with our Ethernet and with our Rocky, and you can even do VXLAN and all these things. Uh, in InfiniBand, it's um, kind of more simple in the sense that you can uh, fire uh, either share the same device across your different tasks, which works pretty well, but less isolated, or you can have uh, virtual functions, but you. Uh, in, in Ethernet, this is also possible, right? There is this like uh, SRIOV without uh, without uh, SDN, right? It's like uh, so you can do something very similar also in the InfiniBand, but that, in InfiniBand, that's the only mode that is supported. Okay, is it like host mode or something? Is that what you're? No, host mode. I think is the way that uh, one device is shared between yeah. everybody. But you can actually create SRIOV, which yeah, means okay. that you slice the device and you put each virtual function and connect it to the to to each container okay. by, by creating a namespace. So you'll have like a virtual function that has its IP address, that has its uh, picky, which is VLAN, okay. and also an IB device that will have a network namespace that is identical, and you, you connect that with the container you have. I and see. then they can communicate between themselves, but you really don't see the, the SDN, so you don't run the OVS with an SDN. It's just like they can communicate between themselves if they're on the same uh, VLAN or the same PICI. Yeah. And so did, did your extensions basically configure all that for the, the container? I mean, the extensions that I showed in the previous slide deal with everything, the, the driver installation and uh, so many things, and provisioning the, the, virtual, the number of virtual functions with the operators. So there's a bunch of stuff that, that you need to do. If, if you're going to install that without the tools, so you should prepare a, a day, if, a full day if you're lucky. But that's what kind of uh, many little things that we work to, to optimize. So you can actually, there is a link in my previous presentation that you can really look online on the whole process of how to install. Um, it's less simple in the sense that there is no SDN. Everybody just like, can communicate with each one. But beyond that, uh, that's pretty much how it goes. More questions? 
No? So it's not. Thank you very Thanks much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next up we have Burak. All right, um, so we're going to look back a little bit. Um, who's attending the um, session for the first time this year? Wow. So that's more than, way more than half the people. So um, who here heard about containers before? <laughs> I used to ask that question every year, and normally no hands would come up, and this is fantastic. Um, everyone heard about it. We, we talk about containers in HPC setting. Um, I'll take you back a little bit. Um, when, when containers started to become a, a, a word other than uh, something that you would mention related to a container ship, um, we, we used to always say Linux containers. Yeah. <laughs> we don't say that anymore. Um, for a while, we um, started referring to everything as Docker. Docker and containers became synonymous because that's, uh, that's the company which introduced us to, um, most of us, to containers. Um, and we would always have a slide up um, which would compare containers to VMs. That, that's how we explained what containers are, because otherwise it was like, what is this thing? Um, we don't do that anymore. And um, in um, uh, in 2013, um, Docker was actually an internal project at a company called Dot Cloud. They were a platform as a service company, and platform as a service being an extremely difficult business model. <coughs> They couldn't make it work either, but somehow the tool that they put out there into, into GitHub at that point got picked up by Twitter and a bunch of other um, hyperscale companies, and all of a sudden the, the company had to be renamed. <laughs> so they, they took the name of their project, Docker, and renamed the company. That's how Docker Inc. was born. Um, the, um, the, the, the very interesting thing is, I, since I was looking up history, I, I looked at the first time I, I heard about Docker, and it was actually an announcement from Red Hat. So, congratulations, you guys. It said, well, we're going to pick up this Docker thing and make it a Linux-wide thing. And that, that's when I went, I remember going back to my co-founder at that time and say, Wolfgang, we need to implement Docker containers. Because we were writing a container spec thinking we would have a runtime engine at some point. We decided not to do that. Um, for, I think, a year after that, uh, Docker was always beta, 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 and finally became version one at the end of 2014, I believe. So the, the, the container session that we had in uh, 2015, this is, this, is, this is actually a slide I might have presented. I, I don't quite remember. Um, it, if, if you can read it, it talks about two hosts. So we, we were trying to get multi-node parallelism to work inside of containers, um, trying to figure out what it really means for high-performance computing. So look at how far we have come in just you know, about four years. Um, we, we were trying to figure out what containers meant for MPI. I, I mean, we, we discussed this one to death. Should MPI run outside of the container or inside of the container? And um, we, we still don't agree, do we, Shane? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only just by first. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. We we decided to disagree and um we, we agreed on that. Um we, we had a number of workloads already containerized at that time. Um I know uh, Lawrence Livermore guys were working on singularity. <laughs> but I'm uh, sorry. Um yeah. and um Nursk was working on shifter. Also at Berkeley. Also at Berkeley. Um, and I remember meeting these teams and in both cases saying, oh, this is brilliant. Um, because they were approaching a problem that they had related to uh, user-defined, um, let's say, workspaces. And um, they, they loved the concept of a container. They hated the concept of a runtime engine. So they did something about it. Um, so two very successful projects. Great job, you guys. 
Um, this is us back in 2017. Um, we spilled out to the to the hallway. Um, there were so many people um, who wanted to hear about containers in HPC. Um, it, it was standing room only, and people were sitting in the hallway, literally. Um, the, the tool set started to get exciting in 2017. We were, um, I think you had a session about Kubernetes. That might have been even 2016. You. Uh, it, it was not at the, it was at the ISC floor, I think. Um, you were talking about Kubernetes and Univa, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it could have been Docker. Singularity Shifter, Docker, Charlie Cloud, they were all names that people were starting to wrap their minds around and it got really confusing I was confused um, and we tried every single one of them tried to understand you know what they mean um, and, and I will ask about your comments in just a second here but um, today what I'm getting out of this session is there's beer there's coffee you can mix them doesn't really mean they taste good together. <laughs> so we, we did a lot of that today. I, I don't know if you realize. Um, so we, we, we need to think about that a little bit better. Um, then um, I also noticed in 2017 we were talking about orchestration. That means we were starting to get successful with running things inside of containers to the level that we would think about orchestration. Uh, so um, in 2018 things um, Things got even more interesting. Singularity became super successful at HPC centers. Um, there were already hundreds of deployments around the world. Um, congratulations, that, that's, that's just great. Um, we, at that time, we understood orchestration very well. In, in about a year and a half, we, we got this orchestration thing figured out, which is, which is pretty amazing, I think. Um, and all of a sudden, um, most HPC schedulers, well, maybe multiple HPC schedulers had native support for containers. Now it's all of them. Um, and they actually support more than one runtime today, which is, which is quite, uh, quite good. And um, we understood GPUs, we understood InfiniBand. Um, and I, credit to you, Christian, I, I think we, by 2018, maybe maybe a bit earlier than that, we had a pretty good idea about what was missing and what needed to be done about it. B before then, we, we didn't really even know what to ask for. Um, so uh, we could we could go to providers and say we want this next for the HPC use case. Doesn't mean they listened to us, but we tried. Now um, here we are, 2019. Um, there are many success stories, um, multiple people in this room, um, others who have spoken, they already are successful with, with containers in HPC space. There's nothing to be scared of. It does work. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean there's one way to make it work. There are multiple ways. They are usually conflicting with each other, so you still need to read up and learn a lot. I mean, today it took us a whole day to talk about what's possible. There, there's, there's so much to digest. Um, the the good news is majority of the orchestrators that you guys use already have some sort of container support probably a very good way to get started so um, be, being able to go back to someone you're familiar with and asking for help is actually the best place to to get started um, the the other thing that I notice is the um, the gaps and roadmaps are extremely clear at this point and we know what we are doing so um, I'm going to grab my notepad I'm looking for some feedback I'm, what are your comments um, what do you think we achieved this year and we can use the catch phone again but I think like the orchestration support I would think yeah you are right everyone integrated it but in an old-fashioned way right doing MPI run Singularity run. It's it's like a, a wrapper. It's not. I think it's not native. That's what I'm saying. I, I agree with that. Yeah, um, and it does work for single binary applications quite well. MPI run type of applications, um, but there's there are still gaps outside of that. Yeah, and for I, complex workflows, etc., you still have to go out and find a solution. And for for MPI, I heard when when Thomas Sterling in his talk he said that uh, the next system, the Aurora system, I think is like using PMI. I think, or it's on the ECP roadmap. 
to be announced, but he had it on the slide, so. <laughs> so where's our little box? There. There. <clears throat> so what did you guys hear today? Feedback. We can just do it like with the, the wedding flower bouquet. We just, someone needs to catch it and then. So for me, it was interesting. As I've mentioned in the talks, I'm not an HPC person, but I'm a container runtimes or engine person. So what was interesting for me was to learn about the core requirements that HPC folks have. Um, which gives me a clearer view of how I can get the tools to be more attractive to this community, for instance. Fantastic. <laughs> and I think that's an achievement kind of that, that we, we brought together, like, or not we, like the, the whole community is sneaking up to the non-HPC community and vice versa so that we... High we performance talk. computing is a special use case and, um, you know, bubbling that up is, is the number one goal here. So uh, thank you for saying that. We we must have achieved our goal. Okay, so um, I think there's still some, there's work to be done on, on capturing best practices. I think there's a lot that we can still do there, um, especially around uh, trying to show um, people that are building, you know, or developing applications and packaging them, like what's the best way to get, make that as portable as possible. So I think that's one, one area where there's still work. Also that sort of extends to training and outreach to the developer community, right? And um, you know, I think we have, it's sort of in that gaps. We still see some of the gaps between, especially with the growth of um, these new, the, the whole ecosystem has expanded, right? And so I think, you know, trying to get our HPC requirements captured in those in that ecosystem is still, uh, you know, a, a challenge. I think you know, the one that's most obvious right now is sort of like the Kubernetes stuff. That's where I, I see it most clearly. Yeah, and also capture as, as, as Lucas says, like defaulting back to something sane, so that it's maybe not the most performant way, but at least it works. And and allow other people or new, uh, new HPC guys or guys that are not familiar with HPC to experience HPC and maybe get more into the MPI concept and maybe incorporate this in their normal non-HPC workloads and make it more available for people, right? Yeah, so one, one of the things that I think is really interesting that we talked about was sort of optimization of container images for multiple architectures, like the same image. How do we let that image support, you know, x86, PowerPC, but then also how do we um, sort of tag and identify that this container image is meant for specific hardware stacks, specific, you know, use case, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. and how best to, you, like, to run that container image also. Yeah, which would yeah. also go back to this defaulting to some sane thing. So if you, yeah. if you only have a, fat or a single binary for x86 and then you realize, okay, I, I use this image like 10 times now, maybe I should look into optimization for this particular image. Because if I only run it once, then maybe it's fine to have it non-optimized. Right? Okay. And just commenting on the comments, but that's maybe... <laughs> I have the microphone attached, so it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> More comments? It's just for the sake of throwing it a little bit. Yeah, the, the, the thing that I was saying earlier, um, I, I, I think we told all of you guys that everything works great together, and that, that's just not true. Um, <laughs> there, there, are some, there are some terrible things you can do if you start mixing things together without knowing what you're trying to accomplish. And I think we can do a better job of um, documenting some of the more successful blueprints so people can start from somewhere. Um, and that's why I was pointing back to the scheduler guys. I mean, if there's, if there's a good way to run containers in a scheduler to, th that you are using already, that's probably a good way to get started. And if, if your workload is outside of a scheduler domain today, we can, we can always look at what that means. And then there's a big shift coming with Kubernetes. We, sounds like we don't quite understand how that will all wrap together. Is your scheduler the pane of glass, or is it Kubernetes? Is that the pane of glass? Um, 
So that's, but we need to get ahead to of the curve a little bit or, inter, or interact with the Kubernetes community in order to get our voice and our use case heard within the community, right? That's what you guys did with, with the Slurm operator or the Slurm yes. concept. So. Yeah. Oh, damn it. Sorry. Was it empty? Attacked. It's okay, it was empty. Uh, yeah, so the funny thing about uh, Kubernetes is uh, we're always kind of behind the curve in the sense that, you know, Kubernetes 115 came out last night and we all have to relearn half of what we knew because something, something that we thought we knew is not functional anymore, right? Uh, so, uh, yes, we, we, we're going to have to do a lot of uh, things to be more functional with Kubernetes. Uh, you know, uh, data machine in general, we, we do Kubernetes. We love Kubernetes. Makes it very easy for us to schedule GPU workloads for our machine learning users on containers because, you know, uh, that's what we do. Uh, one of the things that is really interesting with integrating Kubernetes is that, unfortunately, you have a deployment Three months later, you can think about redoing a deployment. Uh, and I think that's unfortunately fair for a lot of cloud infrastructures. Uh, uh, you know, you, the, the workload is what matters. Uh, and I think uh, we, we talk a lot about supporting the workload, but we, we should also, and I think that's where the use case part uh, could come into play is maybe you know discussing also some of the workload might be a, uh, might be a useful to try to understand where we're going you know with supporting high performance computing and containers. And <clears throat> on that note, I, I think that the OCI, oh no, the OCI, the Kubernetes uh, custom resource definition and all the abstractions that are on top of Kubernetes are very important for us as well to recognize because then you can reinstall Kubernetes in a newer version but you abstract the complexity out of Kubernetes objects. You abstract it out in, an, in, a, in a custom resource definition, and then the custom resource definition takes care of the different versions of the Kubernetes objects, and the end user doesn't have to care about if it's, it's a job or the next thing of a job. It's, it's like abstracted out. I think that's also important, right? I also say it depends how you deploy your Kubernetes. So you have a a ton of ways of doing it. For example, we use Kube Spray, uh, but you know, often what we do is we'll, we'll tell Kube Spray, you're gonna deploy that specific GitHub uh, shell because you can't just rely on something being functional <coughs> out of the box. Uh, so so you know, you you tag it, you use it, you work with it. Uh, other people might use Q, QBadmin, thing like that. I mean, you know, there is a ton of deployment methodologies for it. Uh, uh, they're, they're not all equal. Let's put it this way. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. Okay, Michael. Thanks. Yeah. So, kind of going down that path of Kubernetes and, and orchestration and, and these new workloads. Um, one thing I think it would be really interesting that that I think we should all start thinking about and talking about is what sort of jobs and workloads and use cases are now possible and enabled thanks to things like, okay, we can do a hybrid services uh, batch combination, right? Like what, what are some interesting and novel things that, that we can do now? Because um, So in my opinion, we're going to see people, as we provide these capabilities, we're going to see people come out and, and bring like really interesting, really creative, totally never done before you know, workloads, and I think it would be really cool to highlight those and talk about those um, just in general over, you know, over the next year or whatever. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, we have the panel afterwards yeah. as well, so of course. Thank you, everyone. I'm the leader of the clapping. Okay, so for those, I think I was, my name was mentioned earlier, but I'm Shane Cannon I'm with NERSC. Um, I'm in the data analytics and services group uh, at NERSC, and I'm also one of the developers of Shifter. So I'll talk a little bit about Shifter, but it's more about just containers in general at, at NERSC. So for those who aren't familiar with, um, with NERSC, we're uh, the DOE Office of Sciences um, 
production computing facility. We have something in the neighborhood of uh, 7,000 users, 750 projects, something like that, 700, 800 projects, usually around you know, over 2,000 publications a year from, from the center. Or not from the center, but from the users of the center. And we support the full portfolio of, of uh, science that gets done within the Office of Science. So that covers everything from climate to cosmology to material science, um, biology, uh, fusion. So it's very broad um, range of applications. And increasingly, you know, traditionally we've been a modeling and simulation shop like most, most HPC centers, but you know, over the past uh, few decades, increasingly it's, uh, we're seeing much more usage from data intensive computing, data analytics, and now we see things like machine learning. So the, the mix of the workload is certainly changing and that's creating new demands on us as a center on how we support that. And so as we uh, get these new emerging sort of communities coming to the center, you know, they, they want to come to it because there's unique capabilities. There's fast file systems, there's, you know, things like uh, flash-based file systems on it. There's the scale itself, which is very powerful. But then, um, you know, for, for those of us who've been in the HPC world for a while, we know what the pain points are when you try to bring an application into, you know, this, uh, this area. So some of the things that uh, slow users down oftentimes are things like this. So at least on our Cray systems, there's no local disk. The OS is typically fairly minimal. Um, it can be somewhat maybe different. There may be some of the, the communities are used to an Ubuntu distro or a CentOS distro and we're running a Slus distro. Uh, the file systems can have uh, different characteristics than what they're maybe used to using. And then, so we've used uh, Shifter as a tool to overcome some of these, these limitations. Uh, we've actually been doing, when we started doing con containers, it was really designed around uh, providing, letting users customize their environment, right? So we've been doing some form of that for quite some period of time. Going all the way back to 2003, where we originally wrote something called uh, CHOS or Cherud OS, that was really designed around um, high energy physics projects needed sort of a tailored environment for each project. And so this was, but we wanted to run them on common infrastructure. So we developed um, CHOS to kind of, uh, to address that. And then in, eventually when the container uh, stuff started to appear, especially when Docker started to appear, we looked at it and we're like, hey, that's a nice set of, you know, a tool chain and it actually looks like a better substitute than what we're doing for, for CHOS. So we started uh, looking at that um, pretty early. We even had an early attempt at this that was just a then wrap around Docker just to so that an unprivileged user could use Docker, but we would limit what they were they could do. So we would make sure they could um, they couldn't run as anybody except themselves. Uh, you know, they uh, I think we would automatically mount up their home directories, things like that. So um, this was useful, but it it um, it was not something that we could really realistically run on our Cray systems, which we already had uh, some fairly large Cray systems. And we knew that there would be some scaling issues with it as well. And so that's what led us to develop uh, Shifter in 2015. Um, and again, our focus was really around customized environments was what we were, we were after. Reason we think containers and science are kind of a good match are you know, the ones that we've probably heard about before. So first off, when we were doing it, a lot of it was just around productivity. It's about the, giving the user ability to kind of control their environment, pick what OS that they prefer, you know, pick the, de, um, take care of their dependencies themselves. You know, all the things that a lot of times they would wind up kind of blocking on maybe the system staff or the support staff trying to answer for them by, you know, compi compiling and installing some new tools and making modules for it, for example. Another was around usability, reusability and collaboration. So this ability to create an image and then uh, lots of people can use it and you could potentially even use it across centers. Reproducibility, so just the ability to go back and take that same image and run it again. Um, you know, there's a lot of times where we change and update the system and then suddenly their applications break and they have to go and recompile them. Or we say we're no longer gonna support this build of HDF or something. And so, you know, if they're trying to maintain uh, reproducibility over a long window that can be challenging. And then finally, uh, portability, just being able to um, take that image and run it at different sites. 
So I've got a few examples of how people have been using uh, containers at NERSC and so, from a few different domains. And we can talk, you know, uh, during the panel discussion, we could talk about some of the others that we're seeing. So the first example comes from uh, STAR. This is uh, a project that's part of the relativistic heavy ion collider at uh, Brookhaven. So they're, you know, colliding like gold, gold nuclei and watching all the stuff that scatters out of that. They're trying to create, you know, conditions sort of uh, from the early part of the, uni uh, you know, the beginning of the, of the universe. And so for them, Shifter was interesting because they could run, this was actually like 32-bit applications that they were still built on. This is how old it was. And so that, coupled with some other characteristics, was really important for them. And uh, so this is just an example of what their Docker file looks like. And their build setup was pretty god-awful. I think just to be able to capture how to build their application alone was probably invaluable to them because they most people couldn't even even build it. They usually just relied on somebody at the site had figured it out and they would maintain it for that site. The other thing that uh, was useful for them with using Shifter is uh, we had a few uh, capabilities that are pretty specific to Shifter um, that they were able to leverage. One in particular was you can loop back mount a writable file system on the compute nodes but it's a femoral kind of thing it's backed by the parallel file system but it's a you you know so we sort of create this sparse file format it and then loop back mount it and so they this it kind of mimics a uh, local disk but without having an actual local disk so they what they would do in their case is they would create one of these start up a database uh, a postgres i think a postgres database or maybe it was mysql and this would serve out uh, this was a read only database they needed it to serve out like calibration data and then they would run you know a few hundred compute nodes against that database and if they needed to scale out more they would just they would replicate that, right? So that actually was pretty uh, important to them sort of achieving their scaling, uh, meeting their scaling needs. Another one, uh, another example that's one of these kind of legacy codes was uh, someone that was running, a, a, you know, this brain modeling code to simulate neurons and it was developed in 1985 and I think they were having trouble just building it on the modern the modern Cray system. So uh, I think this was one that almost they did it on their own. I think some people gave them some pointers, said, well, you might be able to use a container for this. And, and they went out and, and, and figured it out. And so I thought that was interesting. Just uh, they didn't necessarily run at huge scales, but it was something where you know, it was really critical to them getting their, uh, their applications running. And then the last example I've got is um, if anybody's heard me talk before, they've probably seen me show this example, and I keep going back to it because I just think it's one of the more interesting ones. So this is a group that a team that was trying to simulate the next generation cosmic microwave background detectors, and uh, they need to go through like all of these different scenarios to understand uh, sort of the sensitivity, I think, of the devices or something like that. And uh, they had certain milestones that they had to achieve in terms of doing these simulations, and they were. You know, they had an allocation at NERSC that would allow them to run up to the full size of the Cori uh, KNL system, which is something like 9,600 nodes. But when they would, this was a application that's, it uses Python on the outside, but then they use numerical uh, libraries, you know, inside the Python application. So even though it's Python, it is a high performance, uh, it is an HPC application, trust me. Uh, so they were trying to, to scale this out, but they were hit this problem that um, for those of us who've ran Python applications on large supercomputers as seen as just the startup times were killing them, right? So just the time it takes to load all the libraries, traverse it, um, all of that's just getting loading back on the Lustre file system and it just you know, tanks the performance. So they were trying to figure out a way around that and we said, well, you might be able to use, we think containers might be a good way to, to tackle this. So they went through and, and did the work to containerize the application, including um, figuring out how to use Intel compilers to build their application because they, they needed the, the, um, the performance that they got from the Intel compilers. So they figured all that out. Um, we had already figured out the ways to get MPI to map in and get uh, native performance for that. And they were able to scale to the full size of uh, Cori Phase 2. So something like 9,600 nodes and 600,000 cores, I think. Um, 
and you know the key thing here was like this was the difference between them achieving their milestone and not right you know it wasn't just purely a productivity play it was like them getting their science done right uh, before that they basically would spend that they would when they would try to run at scale they would spend the whole wall time just trying to start up the Python application and then they would hit wall time they would never even get any output I think from the run and just a little bit I need I forgot to update all these numbers but I, I did write them down um, about usage at, at NERSC of, of shifter so um, on the right is a pie chart that's a breakdown of um, kind of the different applications that run it at NERSC. Um, this one's kind of broken up in some weird ways, but one of the things that, the way they captured this is they would just, I think, take the binary that was after the S run and, and say, okay, that's the application, right? So I don't know how much A dot out showed up, but maybe that's what other is. Um, so the, the side benefit of this is when they're running, when users are running shifter at scale, then shifter is that application so it, it wound up showing up in this plot so you can see it's a it's up there in this corner here it's not a huge chunk it's something like three to five percent but this is wall time and still today at most HPC centers users are doing the same way they did in 1980 you know they they connect into a login host they build their application they run it through the batch system but we are starting to see some actual uh, you know increasing adoption of containers as uh, the way that they're getting their codes out there um, and, and Shane does the, the wall time you have to shot with the users would the wall time look the same or is it I, I don't have that one of the things I'd like to do is go back and extract from the serm, the slurm logs like we do have the if they used an image in there as part of their launch we can see it and I'd like to go and see like how much you know where's the breakdown in CPU time what scales are they running at stuff like that but I haven't done that yet but I think it would be really cool to look at um, yeah that chart on the bottom is sort of the cumulative number of users over time uh, going back from what is it 2017 so we put some metric stuff inside the the gateway so we could start capturing some of this so I think like you know that earliest thing was somewhere in, uh, in the neighborhood of like 50 users and now I, I think as of today we're at 730 or 740 so that 348 is out of date I forgot to update that so the real numbers I think are something like 12 million lookups 12.7 million lookups uh, 1800 and 56 images and 736 unique users. So NERSC has 7,000 users, but if you look at how many are active and actually are logging into the system and submitting jobs and stuff like that, I think it's more like 1,500 to 2,000. So we're getting a, a decent fraction of the user base that are, are using, using containers. And that number is comparable to the number of users that we see that use Jupyter. Um, which is extremely popular, right? Um, and our NX system, which is our X access uh, gateway. So uh, again, it's getting, it's, it's uh, popular and it, it's increasing in its popularity. We also at NERSC have a, a system that's really de designed to support edge services. So Shifter is our, our solution for doing HPC applications, but then we also need to run just containerized services as well. So this could be anything from AP, you know, like API services to databases to uh, portals, et cetera. So Spin is our, our solution for that. And it to, today, under the hood, it uses uh, Rancher is the kind of orchestration engine that's used. And we actually allow end users to go and run containerized services through this. So we've done a lot of work to secure Rancher so that users we can control what they can do inside that platform and you know they can still mount up their their project data for example but we make sure they can't you know serve up somebody else's data or go access somebody else's data can you comment on why you use docker instead of something else um, we felt i mean I, i've always felt like if you're running services docker's a it's that's what it's designed for and, and we just would prefer to use that most things will just run out of the box with um, you know with docker I think uh, Rancher will be moving to Kubernetes in their next, they, it's already in their current release, but we're not there yet. Um, and then, you know, over time, it's possible that the back end runtime would change to something else, but, um, you know, there's nothing broken there exactly that we, we need to, to address. How do you see this spin used most by the users? Is it that, and I, I just inject yeah. the panel discussion again, but. Uh, 
is it more that they control what the to see what the what the job is doing or is it to like create a job that or a service that inspects the output and and figures out whether it's worth continuing yeah. it's it's a little some people use it for workflows and we're trying to do some additional work to make them even better for doing that right so right now these run on a system that are completely separate from the cray from the Cori system for example and uh, we mount up their home directories and their project file systems but we don't mount up the the Cori scratch file system on that which puts some limitations on it and they can't directly interact with the batch system system um, because our computational people are paranoid, right? The systems people. We're actually talking about, uh, and we've just picked up some nodes, we're going to, we may start running agents directly on kind of login nodes associated with Cori, and we definitely want to do this with Perlmutter, and so I think that will lower the barrier to some of those. We, we need to figure out some security, you know, um, uh, results of that, but I think we've got some ideas. Most of what people are doing is they have science gateways or databases or stuff like that that they're they're running inside this system. But it's cool because they can you know they can control that stuff just like they would if they were running uh, you know Docker on their laptop or something. With with the, with the exception of the limitations we place on them to make sure they don't do something bad. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just mention is so that's you know a lot of that was kind of looking back just uh, looking forward a little bit. Uh, Andrew's here. We've got a project um, that he's the the PI for. That's the super containers project, and a lot. This is kind of the areas that we're focused on. So, yeah, I said one of the gaps is best practices, and maybe that was uh, self-serving because we're going to work on trying to document best practices. But this is something we want community input on uh, for sure. Um, looking at, you know, we do have a variety of architectures that are starting to come up within the DOE space. So we're starting to think about portability across the centers. How do you support different architectures? Um, you know, a mixture of uh, even GPU kind of solutions that are going to be present within the DOE ecosystem. And then also, how do we integrate these into the CI and deployment processes? Uh, and then, you know, outreach and training. So, in fact, the training, uh, the tutorial we did on Sunday around containers was partly to check a box <laughs> for ECP. So, yeah. And we'll, we've got another one, uh, another tutorial in at SC uh, this year as well. And the last thing I wanted to plug was uh, uh, kind of a counterpart to this at SC now. We have something called Canopy HPC uh, that Andrew and I submitted and got approved as a workshop for SC. Um, and with a lot of overlap with the same kind of um, topics and themes uh, of this workshop. Uh, so if you're interested in, uh, definitely come and attend the workshop. Uh, even better, if you've got use cases, you know, experience, papers, uh, research, uh, we'd, you please, uh, you know, we'd encourage you to submit it to the, to the workshop. So the, you can find the URL, I think it's in there. Yeah, I, I posted the URL. Okay, good. I was going to I was going to do that so you beat me to it so thank you. And I think that was it. So I had some other slides but we'll skip past those. Cool. Um, yeah, let's just continue. So we have one one last but not least uh, talk from from CJ and then we will have the remaining minutes for panel discussion. So cool. I'm going to say something before I forget. I uh, made an allusion earlier to an HPC Containers Advisory Council. And one of the things that would be really helpful for us to do here as we've gone through the day is to gather uh, particular areas and topics where we think, hey, this is something that we as a community ought to be able to resolve and get greater clarity on. And that's kind of what that advisory council is about. Um, it's not really for observers, but for people who want to uh, dig in, gather into smaller teams, uh, and say, it, here's what my customers are saying that they need, here are the implementation issues that we have, here are the technical gaps, uh, and let's gather people together to come up with some well 
uh, documented or articulated uh, cases for what it is that we should be doing. So if that's something that you're interested in participating in, um, please let me know. And uh, if there are particular topics, I don't know that we have time for that, but that would certainly be something that would be really good to gather. Uh, and even if you just maybe on your website create some place that people can scribble top issues and put their name by it so that we can go back and forward up with it, that might be a really good thing. Okay. Um, so I wanted to uh, raise a couple of other things here uh, in, based on some of the experiences uh, that we've had. I'm uh, going to kind of talk about some of the things that we as NVIDIA have gone after in terms of broad container technology support, what it is we've done for GPU architectures and multi-node and uh, going for smaller image sizes. Uh, we did allude to some of these things earlier in the day. So we had to make a decision for, we have, as I mentioned this morning, something called the NVIDIA GPU Cloud NGC. And we have a number of uh, images there. And one of the things that we found uh, really helpful to the organization is the Docker tagging mechanism. Uh, we also found that uh, you can go from Docker files to Singularity recipe files, um, and that that worked uh, fairly well. Um, we found that uh, while, uh, thanks Singularity guys, glad to see the addition of um, multi-stage builds in 3.2, um, really good, uh, that we're still, in our own experience, finding that the Docker format seems to enable those multi-stage builds more easily at this point, and um, that uh, given that Singularity supports pulling these natively, you know, we're still looking for, you know, are there any other reasons why we would want to support um, something else. It'd be cumbersome for us to support multiple formats. So um, that's where we're at at the moment. Uh, we also uh, looked at, found that something that was helpful to us was to use a custom entry point handler uh, and to set that up in a way that was usable by both Docker and Singularity. And uh, we're going back and editing some things uh, that were the entry points were usable for Docker but not by Singularity, uh, particularly in the DL images. So we're trying to fix uh, address that. Um, one of the things that this assumes today is that the image uh, uh, file system system is read-only and writing to places like user lib or doing uh, bind-mounted directories uh, like to be able to bring in the Mellanox OFED driver uh, are difficult. Um, so the user is kind of whoever starts the container uh, and we don't want to use a no su you know a sudo and not be able to do app get install right so those get challenges challenging if you can't write the container so this is an area I think where we may want to look carefully we alluded to earlier of why are, what are all the reasons really why you want to go and mess with a container image once it's there um, and what are the alternative ways for being able to do that I think some more discussion is merited there uh, we also um, um, have really tried to provide some documentation um, and sort of codifying some of the best practices that we have. Uh, many people like documenting in code, so we document it in the code that's embodied in HPCM, if you will. Um, in addition to doing that, we have some training materials in this, but I think we could have some more. But we do offer uh, essentially representative cases for some different canonical problems like multi-node or uh, different kinds of things we're trying to do uh, with the benchmarks there. Uh, and more and more were when we ship the container image, it already has both the recipe file in it, like the Docker file, and the HPCM recipe file, so you can see what was handed to HPCM in order to produce this, so that people can use that to learn from. When we look at uh, enabling different container technologies, <clears throat> this is essentially something I brought up also earlier. We, for our part, would like to be able to uh, float all boats and to have something like a common plugin across various container runtimes. A number of the challenges that we're seeing is that plugins may have limited or only predefined uh, capabilities like, yes, begrudgingly I'll let you do a bind mount, but only certain things, right, and under certain circumstances. So it does make sense, right, the, the why you would want to exercise care in this space. So some of the specific examples are we're wanting to copy files in from the host system like libcuda or nvidia smi.so 
row to do a bind mount. Another thing that we ran into is that you may need to query what's inside the container and be able to figure out what's in there uh, so that you know what to mount in. So uh, there are certain versions of CUDA that need to go with certain drivers, and so you need to know sort of, hey, what, what's the matching that I need to do for this? Made to set some library load library paths to find uh, use containers in the container files in the container that are compatible with a particular set of kernel mode drivers, for example. So one of the things that may be useful in this space is, um, uh, you know, uh, we alluded to this this morning. Some of the th kinds of things that you may want to set up uh, would be relevant in the case where there's no scheduler. And if there is a scheduler in play, you may want to make that parameterizable to say, uh, don't do these certain things if I didn't ask you to, right? So that the uh, we think it is appropriate uh, for the container technology runtime uh, to say, you know, I have some context and I should be able to uh, exercise some control over this otherwise I think the alternative is like eh, that's broken I don't want it I'm, I'm not going to do it at all right oops and, and you may want to then have uh, consider an option for that maybe have different levels of trust for plugins or you can have just a general one or if it's signed as coming from a certain place then maybe I'll trust it or whatever and I don't think I mentioned signing in here but uh, I think that this was um, uh, Christoph Altair, is he still here? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I like the some of the points that you made about, hey, what happens when I'm trying to, uh, I have uh, an MD5 hash key uh, and I want, I'm want. i using that to know sort of, yes, this was a certain set of bits, um, but those bits may change depending on sort of how else the container was built or whatever, and I can't identify that. Uh, there's some open questions there, I think, in terms of whether something like signing can help, where you can say, uh, I can tell from the container that it came from this place because it was signed, and as part of the signing, I know what version that is, and even if it ends up with a complete different hash, uh, I still know where it came from, and I still know which version it is. So there may be some uh, interesting things to do in that space. We do tend to have a single image that's optimized for multiple targets. Uh, these are different versions of our GPUs and do that when possible. Uh, we, just for those that may not be familiar with this nuance, it is possible in the compiler to get something that is retargetable, that sort of you can go in JIT for whatever it is that you happen to be on and it's really abstract. Uh, or you can do something that is sort of an older generation and will work for all. Um, but if you really want the best, fastest performance with the least overhead, you may want to compile for a particular target. And uh, Andrew, I know you've been passionate in suggesting, hey, we ought to have come some way of uh, resolving this. Um, I think it'd be our take that uh, we, while we recognize that you may have radically different architectures or whatever that you may want to target in a container, I'd like to see that that's really the recommended versus having some other way to uh, have, you know, simplification of that, have a family of them or whatever. Um, one of the things that uh, we do is if the build system doesn't support multi-arch compilation, then we do stick multiple binaries in the uh, image. And we found that that ends up in the end being pretty negligible in terms of the overall overhead. And we use the entry point uh, scripts to validate and select the correct binary to use based on what the host GPU is. And uh, so that's part of what we're doing sort of internally and dynamically. And we're using some fix-ups inside the image to uh, make that uh, work. So, um, you know, there may be some alternatives to this. One of the things that we've done for multi-node, um, uh, I put open MPI on here, but um, there are recent advancements for this in MPitch as well, uh, where uh, for open uh, for MPI, where you can have sort of various transports and various optimizations that may be available for the target architecture, such as being CUDA aware, uh, that you can essentially detect what's going on on the platform and then appropriately configure uh, whatever your version of MPI is to use that. So, if MPI is there, I mean, excuse me, if UCX is there and available uh, to be able to use that, then great. Um, so we're we tend uh, many 
any of the images that we have up on the NVIDIA GPU cloud use OpenMPA, which support uh, supports um, uh, Slurm and PMI2 and PMIX and UCX, and uh, that's been a good bet for us. Um, we're finding uh, MPIT seems to require some static compile time configuration, less dynamic in the way that way, um, and yet MPIT also has better ABI compatibilities. Uh, so there's you know some trade-offs there. So we, for our part, have tended to use OpenMPI, and uh, most of the developers that we've had that have been uh, submitting have wanted have had sort of a preference for OpenMPI anyway, and that's not going to be true of everybody. Um, one of the things that we did find is that the um, uh, use of .la files, uh, metadata files, uh, tend to inhibit our flexibility um, because they use the RPATH mechanism. Don't know if you know what that is, but it essentially starts to um, limit your choices and override other controls that you might use and say, no, I'm going to put, I'm going to force this to be a prefix as opposed to a post, uh, a postfix on the load library path. And so you may not get the control that you want for this. I uh, mentioned uh, UCX with this. There are a number of alternate choices. Um, uh, the IB component is sort of default uh, uh, for that, uh, starting with OpenMP 4.0 and later. Uh, you can use the OpenIB byte transfer layer. Um, and one of the nice things that we found with this is in terms of being able to find bugs is that you can easily switch back and forth uh, between those to be able to see what's up. UCX is enabled with IB and, and the GPU direct copy, which uh, avoids extra copies and do zero copies as you're trying to get something out over the network from GPU memory, um, but also various different kinds of sharing across processes like with uh, XPMEM and KNEM and CMA. It also uh, picks the optimized transport at runtime based on the host capabilities, uh, whether MOFED's on the host, um, whether the kernel modules are available, um, uh, and uh, one of the things that is tricky about that is it requires shipping multiple versions in the container to be compatible with whatever uh, might happen to be on the underlying platform. Uh, for InfiniBand, uh, we support this through MoFed and RDMA Core. Um, uh, we were really delighted when we convinced Mellanox they were not they were going to break forward and backward compatibility, and we we as a community, congratulations, uh, convinced them to not do that. And so, as of 4.4 and beyond, uh, they have sort of forward and backward compatibility. Uh, we do need to support uh, GPU extensions to some things like NV Pyramid, which you need to be able to get best performance. And we're passing in host driver libraries that can be problematic. Um, one of the challenges is that you know things can be named differently for different underlying OSs, and you can have transited dependencies uh, that you don't know about, so that's not all obvious. So this is, I think, this notion of what really are the dependencies for what's in the image, and how can those best be declared, and how do you do that efficiently when there can be a bunch of transitive dependencies for what's on the host and things might change underneath you anyway in ways that would work normally except you know if you don't happen to have whatever you needed on your host platform. Uh, so we are um, packaging multiple of these releases inside a container, and that selection's handled by the entry point application. And so there are a number of things that need to be relocated or read uh, in from the host, uh, or things that we need to set for the library path, and and so on. Um, PMI is uh, something that uh, we think is, a lot of people think is important, and there are three common APIs for this. Um, unfortunately, the implementation, various implementations that aren't ABI compatible, um, and so there's some trade-offs uh, across using each of these. Um, and we do essentially uh, try to support all of those. And uh, so there are, one of the things that's important for us is we want a various different ways of being able to do a multi-node launch. You can do that inside the container or outside the container. And uh, there are sort of pros and cons to these. Um, we've had to look at this as sort of how this works with Singularity. And uh, it does uh, require a compatible host, uh, open MPI and PMI installation. Uh, which can be a little bit tricky. Um, I know people want to get out of here, so I'm trying to go fast. Uh, so you can also do this with um, SRUN. 
again, that works uh, with Singularity. I think I have, a, you can use the PMIX or PMI2, and that's uh, more familiar and maintains the integration with the host resource manager. Um, it does require a compatible PMI installation again, but the Slurm PMI2 seems to be available on most systems that we've found just as a as an experience is with. And uh, you can also do this with the containers MPI run and do that uh, from inside it. And that, again, works on most systems without external compatibility issues. It's better contained. It lets it be more reproducible that way. Um, but it doesn't have any integration with the host resource manager. And a lot of times, um, that's pretty important. Um, and finally, I think with the image size, um, we have found uh, that a lot of people, some people just don't care. Um, but a lot of people have said that image size is really important and that when you have lots of containers and you have lots of versions of those containers and they're all floating around and you're trying to distribute those around into lots of nodes and that kind of stuff, it can be really painful. You can lead to uh, performance issues of having to move too many bits across the network with this. And we've been making heavy use of the Docker multi-stage builds to ensure the smallest pos image size possible. Um, and uh, so, and as an example, Example, a LAMPS container, which sort of um, uh, it could have been a gigabyte, uh, we found, uh, gets at 100 megabytes, whereas a single bare metal binary is on the order of 70 megabytes. So that's worked pretty well for us. All right. So I think I want to end there. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, CJ. I think we, maybe you can keep the microphone. Maybe you have like 10 minutes or a little bit less for the last round of panel discussion. Things like questions in general. Free for all, Free for all yeah. Yeah, I mean it's seven minutes if you, you we could. So in certain markets like uh, mechanical design automation, electronic design automation, they make use of a whole host of commercial software applications. Uh, to design a chip, you need at least 40 different applications. MDA, the, the numbers aren't quite so bad. Um, I'm aware of the work that uh, the great folks at UberCloud have done in terms of getting some of these ISV apps into the cloud and so on, and some of them being containerized. Just wondering if, um, I, I, I think this is something we should be concerned about in terms of adoption to, uh, to really gain traction in enterprise markets. Uh, just wondering if if this is something that matters to other people, uh, if there have been successes, um, you know, how do we as a community try to uh, encourage this, right? And again, it's notwithstanding the great work that NVIDIA and Docker and everybody else has done, it's just getting some real commercial ISV codes up there. So the issue is just, you don't feel like they've, they haven't quite embraced it yet? <clears throat> I think we need to embrace it to really have container adoption uh, percolate out beyond Some a lot of the markets. markets that we've been talking about yeah. today, right? Education, uh, government. Uh, and into some of the I, more commercial environments. Even within the you know the scientific space, um, I'd say it's the people that have adopted it's still a subset, you know. And I, what has not happened as much as I would have expected by now is the thing I was anticipating is that certain communities would kind of percolate up, you know, some a group that would say like they're going to handle our container builds and they'll create images and we'll just all use those, right? And it's happened a little bit, but not as not as much as I was expecting. And so um, we, you know, we're hoping through some of the ECP stuff that we can help promote that within ECP. But yeah, I guess it's, it extends outside of that space as well. Um, it's maybe it's a way for the Uber cloud people to make money. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Also, the, the HPC advisory or container advisory council. I think maybe we want to, in the future, also put up proposals for possible papers that we can then reuse at this this workshops. Right? We try to have some paper submissions for this workshop. I think we had four, so it's it's not as plentiful as we would have liked. And maybe we can use uh, the advisory council as well to say, okay, we want this to be in a paper, and then maybe we can find people collaborating on this as well.
Yeah, so. Oh, I think he had to leave. Okay. Yeah, yeah he had to leave. So, yeah. so if you look in the, uh, the link is in the Slack, uh, otherwise it's the, uh, it's the website for the conference. Uh, it's open until July 1st. And then there's Canopy as well if you can't make that deadline. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. So, you know, back to your comment, you know, maybe the other way to proceed there is, is find at least one vendor that's interested in this and really work with them to, to you know, figure out how to package it well, demonstrate running it portably across, you know, different systems or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, comments. Um, so, um, I, I, I've been in touch with multiple um, ISVs. Um, what the ISVs find very challenging is um, they have no control over where these containers will work. Um, and I'm sure you ran into the same. Um, and being able to support containers on multiple, let's say, um, multiple clouds, on-premise systems, is just not something they are very familiar with. Um, but a number of ISVs are researching containers, trying to learn more. Um, I give them a few more years is what I would, what I would recommend. So I wonder. Maybe somebody could throw it back to Andrew. Okay. Um, one of the uh, things that I wonder about this. Yep, I'm gone. How about? Okay. Yeah. One of the things that I wonder about uh, here. I'm sure. <laughs> You're keeping him on his toes. I'm going to Bavaria in a couple hours. Um, so, one of the things that I wonder about too is. Um, uh, <coughs> For people, you know, uh, take, uh, you know, some of the people that have been working in the manufacturing simulation space or whatever, they've had a well-established set of distribution channels. Their customers are used to getting the product and distributed in a certain way. That's happened for a really long time. Why are they going to use anything different than that? However, uh, if you have somebody, uh, I just got back from Japan and we were talking to a lot of people in the genomic space, there's... It looks like uh, we're coming over the horizon. There's a there's a storm cloud of various different kinds of containerized applications and open source applications and some frameworks where part of it's open source, part of it's proprietary, and that kind of stuff. And people are going to be wanting to push that out. And that's a that's a category of people that can't afford to have and don't have well established IT departments that are going to have all the expertise that know what it uh, what it takes to install these or, complicated or things. some established channel how they're already getting. Or exactly. Something like that. Yeah. And so it's in more the new and emerging markets where there may be more opportunities for these, where the people using it are less likely to have sort of the expertise and the market that you can reach uh, with this kind of enabling may be significantly better to where it's worth putting somebody, you know, putting the effort, maybe even hiring somebody to put in the effort to be able to get that distribution. Okay, um, I would like to suggest, uh, uh, or I would think it would be really beneficial to have uh, one of the, those, those vendors of exactly that kind of software part of, uh, of the panel maybe next year. I'm particularly thinking of uh, companies who make uh, um, software where uh, the HPC component is coupled, say, with uh, uh, graphical user interfaces. So, for example, uh, Siemens PLM uh, for, for Star CCM or Ansys or, or Schrodinger, maybe we can, can convince them to become, uh, to, to uh, to go the, uh, to the stage for uh, the next time. We'd, we'd like to do that, and we welcome that for NGC if you're being able to do that, for example. But I'm not, I'm not sure that maybe you would disagree with the criteria that I put if there are existing distribution channels that some of those same folks are trying to use. What, what's new? Or maybe you want to clarify what you think is different. I just want to learn from you. If I mean, their the, URL I'm, doesn't end in .io, then don't even bother talking to them, right? No. <laughs> no. But, I mean, if, you could, if we could find one that's interested, then all yeah, the better, be great. right? It's, it's it. getting, finding a willing dance partner. Yeah, I, think and I, I think, you know, we want to foster first followers, right? We're, we're, in, we're interested in finding people. We're already seeing people who are doing mashups with uh, HPC and Biz, for example, um, by... I didn't mention this case before, but like the DL stuff is an example of a lot of people that just want push button like TensorFlow. I have no idea what it does, but there are a lot of people out there that want to run TensorFlow. <laughs> yeah. It's like, and everything is through Jupiter, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. so. So I just wanted to comment on Ian's question. I think we're still 
there's two key pieces that I think we really need to get right and get right soon. Um, the first is sort of this automated build system for containers. If I can link this all with my CI system, do CI testing, and have it spit out a container that I know is tested and validated and can run on multiple systems, that's going to be a huge win. I don't think we're that far from that. There's a whole lot of, we've got some turning that we need to do, but that's one aspect. The other aspect is the interoperability aspect. You know, I, what I don't want is for my set of best practices to be, well, with OpenMPI, you've got to do this, this, poke this hole in this container that way, and, and turn this other knob. I think I want to have it where it's like, deliver, deliver me a libaccelerator.so and a libfabric.so, name it whatever you want. And, and so long as I have those two things on my host, I can run my container, right? Within, within like, let's say, an x86-64 architecture. Yeah. I, think, I think if we can get those two sort of concepts correct across the industry, all of a sudden all, all I have to do is just take whatever container is spit out of a build system and hand it to an analyst who has no idea, you know, what is in that enterprise HPC app. They just want to run it and get the results. Yeah, I think that's a good... Last remark, because we are actually yeah. out of time. That's not easy, though. <laughs> <laughs> you do say it's possible. No. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys, for attending. Like, a round of applause for the rest. We did it. And yeah, I think see you, and, uh, see you seven next time. For yeah. Organizational leadership, and I think a lot of personal <laughs> he, 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 did that. he just wanted the toys, right? He just wanted the toys, that's right. It's always the toys.